This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hey everyone, welcome again to another edition of the Tesla Owners Online Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page. It is June 6th, and I want to bring on my usual guests here, Eric Camacho and Ian Pavelko. Gentlemen, how are you doing this evening? Hello, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I think we need to take a little moment and just say uh, and recognize that today is the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings. Without those fine fellas fighting for everyone, we would not enjoy the freedoms that we have today. So, uh, you know, props to those guys. Not many of them left anymore, of course, 75 years. It's a long time. I I watched a number of them. um, A lot of the cable news stations this morning were covering uh, Mm -hmm. the events live um, from France, from the beaches. And it was really inspiring to see them there. I mean, I think there was a group of um, something in the, I I don't know if it was several dozen, 90. There there was quite a number of them there today. And I mean, they all had to be somewhere between 93 and 98 years old by my watch. Yeah. I was like, wow. It just kind of boggled my mind to think they're standing there today and they were there when it happened. And I mean, the thoughts that must be, and and what they were telling us is there were a number of them present who had never been back. Can you imagine? And for the first time, 75 years later. Yeah, I I can imagine. Going to Normandy and visiting those beaches is certainly on my bucket list. So eventually we'll get over. Yeah. Very much so. You know, I'm a very, I mean, you're probably like me, very much a World War II buff. Yeah. Uh, following a lot of that stuff. I've been watching, you know, a Band of Brothers and Pacific all over again because that's want yeah. I like to do once in a while is just to kind of dig in. So, yeah. Anyway, so good props to those guys. Uh, so please, you know, if you uh, if you have family or whatever that was involved in that, uh, make sure that uh, you give them props for that because uh, it's pretty important. You're here. Yeah. Um, some good news this week. Lots of stuff that's been happening in the Tesla thing, but I think we want to spend this evening here and uh, spend uh, quite a bit of time and talk about some of the information that really came out of uh, Ryan's uh, podcast. Now, if you haven't listened to Ryan's podcast, well, you're dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. Um, yes, Ryan McCaffrey, a good friend of ours. Uh, he has a podcast called Ride the Lightning. He does a weekly Tesla podcast. And last week, uh, he celebrated the 200th episode, and uh, he finally got to have his dream, which was to interview Elon Musk. Now, uh, this is something that I've been talking to Ryan about, and uh, he's been working on this for about six months. So it finally happened on Wednesday of last week. Um, and, of course, you know, as uh, Ryan's an excellent interviewer because, you know, he is a journalist after all. He has some good creds that ways, and uh, he does it for a living. And he was able to sit down for uh, with Elon for over an hour and um, definitely got some information out of him. So uh, we're just going to kind of go through some of the stuff. Now, for those of you who are new to the podcast or new to the YouTube channel, welcome. Uh, I hope you're able to follow along. Uh, We try to uh, make sure that we cover as much of the Tesla information as much as uh, humanly possible, but sometimes it just gets out of control, and other times it's a little slower, but that's that's okay. That's how how things go. Um, All right, so the first thing we want to talk about is... Uh, he spent some time talking about the pickup truck because um, out of any of the projects that they're currently working on, um, Elon's made it no secret that that's his favorite. Um, he did let it slip, though, that they're hoping to undercut uh, the guys at Rivian. They're hoping to have the pickup truck come in under $49,000 US. Of course, Tesla being Tesla, you have to remember that when they sell something new, it's always the most expensive version first. So eventually they will get down to the low end. Um Having said that, I, I I want your thoughts on this. I I always expected the the um this the, the pickup to come in at seventy five thousand US base price. So this is quite surprising. It's that was a mind blowing number when I heard it. Uh, I was kind of like, how on earth are they going to pull that off? You know, like ten G's more than an entry level Model Three. Um, when you think about it, pickups in and of themselves are not terribly expensive to, to manufacture. That's why, you know, the American OEMs love them. They're super profitable. There's not a whole lot of material. I mean, the framework and some of the parts, you know, the drivetrain are, are, are a bit pricey. But there's not a lot in terms of body work on them. You know, it's just big, easy to stamp out sheets. 
Um, not a huge amount of complexity to the interiors. It's just a lot of empty space in back. So I got to think that the cost of building it in raw materials is not enormous. But to do the work you need to do with the truck, you need a lot of power. They're going to need a fair size battery pack. I got to think at 49,000, it's not going to have a huge amount of range. That's how I'm thinking they're going to pull it off. You know, I, mean, I don't think it's going to have a lot more battery power than what we have in, in you know, an SR Plus. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised. But I don't know. The numbers in my head, I, I can't quite make it work. But fantastic news if it does, you know, hit that yeah. price point. Well, the one thing that he did mention <clears throat> is that he said that they're they're hoping to offer something that's better in terms of functionality than a Ford F-150. So when he mentions Ford F-150, that's definitely the target market that they're going after. And they want better performance um, and and handling than a Porsche 911. Well, of course, that's kind of a given when you have something that, you know, that's electrified. Uh, no, again, not, not on the base model. Slightly more reasonable. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to outhandle a 911 with our truck. Holy <laughs> cow, does this guy shoot for the moon? Yeah. I, you know, um, like... So it'll be interesting what they do. Um, I just kind of went back to what he was talking about last year when he was soliciting ideas from the public and in terms of input on the truck. We do have some specs. I'll reiterate those specs now. I want to remember, I want to remind everyone though that uh, these things could potentially change. So don't think that these are set in stone. These things could potentially change. Now last year, Elon revealed that the pickup truck, they were aiming to have six seats in the car four to 500 miles of range per charge, dual motor all-wheel drive, that's kind of a given, um, a 240 volt connection for heavy duty tools, and up to 300,000 pounds of towing capacity, just to name a few, uh, a few features that we know at this point. Now, the 300,000 pounds, let's face it, I just, you know what, um, I was at a Tesla meeting this past week, and we had some um, uh, people come and talk about towing capacity because they sell trailers, um, airstreams and that type of thing, and they do tow hitches. And the one thing that I always, and, and I'd seen these guys a couple years ago because we had them at the at the meeting there before. And one thing that they mentioned about towing is that marketing speak as far as pickup trucks, um, they're 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 marketed as towing vehicles, but honestly, they're not the best at towing vehicles, especially if you're doing things like um, campers. You really want something that's a lower center of gravity. I mean, they went through all the specs and they have all the math to prove this stuff. Um, they generally recommend, like one of the cars that they tow a lot with is like a Chrysler 300. Uh, and they had a 27 foot Airstream, $140,000 camper. And they were pulling it with a, a Volkswagen Tiguan. So mm. this, this idea of, of needing a great big, you know, king cab pickup truck to pull something is, is hogwash. You don't. So, you know, 300,000 pounds. Okay, fine. You can tow an aircraft carrier if you need to, but honestly, do you? <laughs> You know, do you really need to? But anyways, those are the specs that he has said they could potentially change. But I think it, it really shows that, th that again, it's another market that's ripe for disruption. Uh, Rivian is certainly there. Tesla wants to do something um, in that space. I do want to bring something up, though, too, because one of the other bits that he did finally announce, because Ryan asked the right questions, was uh, this picture. Of course, those of you who are listening to the podcast can't see what I'm talking about here. But on the screen, I have a picture of the leaked or the spy shot of the uh, cyberpunk pickup truck. And Ryan had asked him, so we need to clear this up. Is that the front or the back of the car of the truck? And he says, that's the front. And it kind of goes with what I was thinking. Um, it definitely made sense. So anyways, it's not going to look like any other pickup truck on the market. I was talking to some people as well. I think the purpose of this pickup, other than Elon just wants to do it, I think he wants to set a trend in the sense that when you see this thing on the street, you're going to go, holy crap, what the heck is that thing? We're, like, what movie did that just came out of? And, you know, honestly, think about it. How many times have we seen science fiction movies and we see these really cool designs and cars and we're like, why can't we have that today? We're like, yeah. why is it that we can't get that? Yeah, they made it for the movie. Like, come on, get busy, you know? Yeah, exactly. So that's uh, that's basically what he said about the, the pickup truck. There is some other stuff that came out of that. Um, there was some more discussion about the Model Y. Uh, the Model Y is uh, is certainly shaping up uh, to be um, a, a great car. Um, they did say that one of the things that they want to change with it is to simplify um, the body construction of the car. So they're saying that they want to go from 70 separate pieces to a single casting. This makes up mostly the bottom part of the car. The bodies, you still have to do, you know, uh, body stamping. But the actual um, bottom frame of the car will be largely a... Um, 
a single cast. They have to build a special machine for this thing. Um, of course, they have some joiners and stuff that, uh, that, that'll that add maybe four parts. So we're talking maybe five parts total. Um, I made a note here. I think that'll make Sandy Monroe happy. Yes, <laughs> he's I always, saw that. He's, yeah, he said that many times before that his, his, his issue with Tesla is the dinosaur technology. They seem to have problems. They over-engineer maybe... You know the bodies of the cars; they're 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 more complicated than they need to be. So hopefully that'll make him handy, uh, happy. Um, I think I don't think there's any other car in the market that's ever been built like that before. Um, maybe I mean a Hot Wheels. <laughs> um, so the the net result of doing a single casting like that is that it will reduce the complexity of building the bodies, of course, and uh, significantly reduce reduction in expenditures in terms of robots. Because now you don't need all these robots, quite as many robots in a single station to do all the welding and stuff. So, so that's kind of interesting. They said that um, they're still hoping to build in uh, in Fremont. They were able to uh, find more room, I guess, from warehousing where they have some parts. So maybe moving some warehousing off site, um, so they can open up some more corners and stuff. So, um, and the other thing too is that they he made a point of saying he he the, the reason for doing the Model Y the way they did was to try and prevent the feature creep that infiltrated the Model X and made it very complex. I mean, one of the reasons Model X was delayed for so long is they just kept piling features on, piling features on, and so on and so forth, and it just got crazy. So with the Model Y, it's you know as you know whatever they said, what was it, seventy five percent of the parts from the Model 3 yeah. as much as possible. And I, I did say, um, you know, we did talk about this on the podcast before, and, of course, my Model Y video that I put out. Uh, the bodies, I mean, there's, I can't see any parts in the bodies that are shared between these two cars. So I think we're, that's the, the large amount of the, of the non-part sharing is really coming from that. Um, let's see here. Uh, not much else. I mean, I, like I said, Ryan did... Uh, did really good work and be able to get the good information out of um, out of Elon as far as that's going. Um, again, not too much talk about the Roadster situation. Um, seems to be on the back burner. It's yeah, I a, mean, his, his assessment of it was, was kind of like, well, look, it's it's a halo piece. You know, like how important really is it to the mission type of thing? And, but then they got back to the, well, you know, don't. Don't count out Halo cars. They do a lot. I mean, sure, you're not going to transform, you know, uh, or, or reduce a huge amount of CO2 by, you know, having a couple of guys change their Aventadors for your Roadster. But they, what they do is, you know, they the intended mission of the car like that is to prove that, you know, they're technologically superior, that there's no reason. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about, you know, a relatively entry-level car or like a hypercar. Electrics can do everything better. That's the whole point of the exercise, very much as it was with the original Roadster. So, yeah. Um, so, the other thing, um, oh, sorry, I just want to get something intro that I thought was really interesting is mm -hmm. he did a little bit of uh, sort of poking into the development phases, both in Model S and Model 3. And one of the conversations I thought was really interesting. Remember all the speculation? We were like, is it, you know, look, the center screen, we've got to have a HUD, right? The HUD, yeah. HUD, HUD. We're all about the HUD. Like, was the HUD ever a thing? I thought that was a really interesting question. And Elon confirmed, no, at no point did he ever want to have a HUD. Uh, they did consider having like a binnacle, a proper instrument pod in front of the driver a la Model S. That apparently was was a big decision whether or not to go with the center screen at all. But at no point ever was there a discussion of a HUD, I thought was interesting. Yeah, I could certainly imagine the talks that they had internally about uh, the decisions they had to make regarding the screens. Now, I remember the first time Elon had started talking about the Model 3 was back in about 2013. And, um, and I can't remember, he was either in Germany or Norway. And one of the items that he did say is that, well, we're debating whether to go with one screen or two screens. That that still stuck in my oh, mind okay. from, from way back then. So I'm sure that was an internal debate that they had. And of course, we all know it certainly worked out. Um, you know, I had that conversation this past weekend because I was at a car show and people were talking about the Model 3. Oh, it's got the iPad. Everybody calls it an iPad. I'm like, it's not an iPad, but whatever. And uh, and I, I just try to remind, remind people, you know, the, the, the center screen thing is not unique. There's been many cars on the market that had the center screen. It's just you've never seen them before, <laughs> you know. So did, it, it definitely makes an impression. Yeah, did I? I never. I don't think I told you guys this, but uh, the last time I went into the U.S. through one of the smaller border stations here in Quebec, going through into the American side, I, the border guard reached in, looked at it, and goes, "Oh, are you allowed to have a laptop up there?" <laughs> <laughs> First time I got that, I was, yeah, I, you know, we've seen it, you know, and the cops pulling people over. Hey, you can't have that there. I got the question legitimately. It's like, really? Mm, yeah, let me explain this to you. Uh, well, you know, when you're in a small border town, they don't probably get as much fancy stuff. No, it was the first time she'd seen a Model 3, so. Oh, well, there you go. Well, won't be her last, I'm sure, <laughs> at the rate things are going. 
Um, I can't think of anything else. I mean, there's so much that was discussed and stuff, but um, yeah, yeah, the important stuff was really discussed. And um, again, um, he wasn't really willing to reveal any extra information. I mean, I'm sure Ryan knows where to steer his questions and not really get into stuff that he probably can't answer anyways. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some scuttlebutt going around, of course, lately, of course, again, about, you know, potential SNX refresh. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the uh, viewer questions. But, yeah, all, all in all, um, very good, um, excellent, I should say, interview on Ryan's part. So uh, I want to say a big congratulations for Ryan for uh, for getting that. I'm totally jealous. I would have... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I would have asked uh, I would I would have asked personally, but that's just me. A lot more technical questions, um, but hey, you know, somebody had to do it. Yes, and, uh, and no better guy than Ryan because you know he's uh, he's the man. He's the man. I mean, it was it was very apparent during the interview that one Ryan did his homework, and even Elon was surprised by just how well prepared Ryan was uh, mm -hmm. with the line of questionings, and it seemed very fluid. Uh, from going from one question to the next to the next. So that is, by and large, just how great Ryan is at what he does. Uh, and he was able to take someone of Elon's stature, sit him in a room, not only, like, just have the audio, but, like, because, you know, you can always edit the audio, but, like, they recorded it on video and put it on YouTube uh, for everyone to see it. And it was just as casual as if Ryan was just talking to his brother or, uh, you know, a neighbor. <laughs> exactly. Whatever, like, like, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Pro so major props. All right, let's jump in and get some more Tesla information here. Uh, our good friend Vincent on the uh, on Twitter uh, jumped out and asked uh, Elon. He says, uh, "Dear Tesla team and Elon Musk, some customers from Japan reported that unable to choose the white seats when ordering the Model Three. Can you guys fix that? Thanks." Well, Elon piped in and said, "Well, we're trying to simplify product complexity, so we're only offering white, technically black and white interior in high volume markets for now." Again, this kind of goes back to what t Elon had said before. Now that they're moving the right-hand drive cars, they have to ramp up that production. Uh, it's you know it's just a matter of time before they offer uh, that option. Maybe some other stuff for the European markets. Um, probably just a matter of a few weeks and stuff. So if you're really waiting for a white interior on the Model Three, um, I would suggest you hold off <laughs> a little bit. We, now we did get some reports that uh, the ships are definitely on their way. So the, uh, they should be arriving just a matter of a few weeks. They're just crossing Panama now. So that's about another two weeks or so. And then uh, some of these cars will start to get delivered in the UK. So looking forward to that. If you get your cars, let us know. It'd be uh, interesting to find out uh, how soon you get them, what you think of them. I'm sure you like the cars. You know what? I want to add one more thing to the Ryan interview. And uh, Ryan had asked him about the situation, about the SDK or adding apps uh, through third-party developers on the, um, on the cars. And uh, Elon said that, look, the, the, the idea is not dead. They're still considering it, uh, but they definitely want to have a larger fleet of cars so they can make it economically valuable for more people. Right now, their, their resources are just stretched too thin. So I think that bodes well. I, I just hope that they take security into consideration uh, because, uh, you know, last thing you want is some kind of deadbeat app and they're just taking down your car and stuff. So still encouraged to hear that. Man, I am not on my game tonight. No, I think everything okay? Or we're, we're yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. The pie threw him off. The, yes, I think that was it. Because, yes, you were all it's, focused and dialed in. and then pie It's sitting and it here fun. literally in front of me, and I can't stop looking at it. There? Oh, my God. Eric nailed I, it. That's exactly Listen, if I sound here. a little distracted tonight, it's because my wife made me this little miniature lemon meringue pie. She brought down this large blueberry pie, and I showed it to the boys before the show. <laughs> and then she brought down this lemon meringue well, no meringue on it, but this and I got it here on my desk, and I keep staring at it. So if I seem a little off, and I'm not on my A game tonight, you'll know. Got you'll know why. On the pie. <laughs> I got my eye on the pie. Anyhow, uh, the other breaking news this week. Well, it's not that big of a news here. Uh, Tesla has released their very own wireless charging pad for the Model Three. Starts at uh, well, starts. It's $125 US. It has no capability of doing a landscape um, charging. Um, and that's about it. So I uh, still recommend the, the Jetta over the Tesla one. Uh, listen, uh, you know, Tesla's not making this. They've got some kind of OEM making it for them. By the way, this is the Jetta one. This is the prototype, by the way, for the second version. They sent me this. So um, on the Jetta current pad, you can do three phones. So one in landscape, two in portrait. 
and uh, index as well and stuff. So, but and, and this is only ninety nine bucks, by the way. So you can buy the Tesla one if you want to spend another twenty five. And you know the guys at Jet are pretty good. I'm sure they got some other products in the works and stuff. So, uh, anyways, give them some business. We like those guys. Link will be down in the description if you want to buy one of them. But uh, hey, there's some people that want OEM and uh, they'll they'll pay the Tesla premium if they want. Just like you know, some people like to pay the Apple premium, like like this dumb dude. But whatever. <laughs> Ah, uh, let's see here. Oh, the other thing too is our good friend at Stats uh, Stats app. Um, if you haven't used the Stats app on your on your phone, and of course there's no Android version. I apologize. It's Jones, uh, for iOS at this point. Um, man, is this thing ever cool? Have you guys got this on your phone? You play with this? No. Yeah. No. Yeah, yes. I, I, I did. Well, yes. I, I've been I've been so delinquent on the electronic side of the car. I'm catching up quickly. So I got the Stats app going about I don't know two three weeks ago, and I've really been enjoying it. Um, when we start to do the development work on the EV wheel and we start data logging, I think it's going to be super helpful to complement what's on board with the car. So that was the main reason for getting it. But I've been a lot of fun just poking around with the different things you can do with it. It's cool. It's great because he's you know he's got a watch uh, companion with it and stuff. Uh, so I you know I use the hand digging this thing to open up the doors and uh, especially the, the the rear trunk. Uh, which is something that bothers me on the Model X. You got such such a great car, and then I don't have any hands free way of opening the rear trunk. Like what gives? I had that on my Ford. Although there is a product that I just found. The guys that uh, do. It, did you guys watch the uh, Tesla Raj's latest video where he installed the lift the power lift gate on the Model? Yeah, thing? with his foot. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So apparently, and and it caught me because I didn't even know it. He said in the video that they make a foot actuator for the model x and i uh, looked at the website 400 bucks do i spend the 400 bucks because i would totally love that on the model x so yeah. anyways if i do yeah. it i'll let you know <laughs> anyway so uh, that's the one feature that i use it uh, a lot for of course is uh, being a habit on my phone and it, you know it, it demos quite well you know when you have this app on your phone and you can show people look at all the things you can do and stuff so kudos to this guy he's doing a really great job i mean every every week he's coming out with new updates and stuff so he's really putting a lot of time and effort into it so you know give him some business check it out it's a great app i use it all the time yes Speaking ian talk yes it looks like you finally joined us in the 21st century <laughs> imagine <laughs> I figured out that this car does more things than take you places. It's really quite remarkable. It's It's got places you can plug things in and observe things. So tell us about that USB key that you just yeah. got. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm so late to the party on um, sentry mode and the dash cam and all of that. So finally, um, I've been shamed into doing it. And uh, I caught up quick, though. Uh, I didn't decide to just go out and format a standard USB key and, and have at it. Um, recently, um, the uh, gentleman who brought us Stats app has brought us a new product called Sentry View. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's only for iOS again, as Trevor said. But well, um, Nate Nate McComb has one for, for uh, Android. Windows. For yeah, uh, for yeah, for Windows. For that's Windows, right. yeah, that's yeah. it exactly. So you can go with Nate's, and we should throw a link in for Nate's if you yep. want to do the Windows version. And for iOS, you can do the uh, Stats app version called Sentry View. That's the the all one word Sentry View if you go to the App Store. So what you need is basically uh, to make this work to its fullest, you want to get the SanDisk Connect wireless USB key. So basically, it's a USB thumb drive that's got its own little Wi-Fi uh, transmitter in it so you can access it directly with your phone from the car. It's really cool. So basically you buy one of these things. They come in 64, 128, and 256 gig formats. I got the 64 because A, I'm cheap and I didn't know how much I was going to use it. So, <laughs> um, But it works great. So I formatted the thing, fired it up, put it in there this morning and uh, it works great both with the dash cam and with the sentry mode. If you want, you can go into the car at any time. You can just, you have to pull it out. I have to say when you're recording, obviously the USB is inserted. So it's operating and recording. Anytime you want to watch what you recorded, you simply remove it from the USB port turn it on. There's a little button on the side of the unit. So it's self-powered. It has a little battery in it? Yeah, it has a little battery in it. It takes okay. about two hours to charge. If you plug it into the USB port, you turn it on, and I don't think you guys can see that on the camera. There's a tiny, tiny little miniature light in there that starts I blinking. See it. There yeah. you go. And what happens is you basically look for it like you would a regular Wi-Fi network in your house or your office. So it'll, it'll appear uh, as an available network. You connect to it with your phone, and now you can actually start looking at uh, all of the footage that it's captured. It's super easy to do. And one of the nice things, just like Nate's uh, Windows app, you can actually see 
all of the cameras at once. You don't have to go because typically, if you just store it on a on a standard USB key and you don't have any special app, you have to look at each camera individually. So the yeah, left yeah. cam, the right cam, uh, re repeater, I should be uh, saying, and then the front cam. With this, you can visualize them all at once. Uh, Trev, so it I syncs them up, right? In, yeah, in exactly. Trev, cool. I, I shot you some pictures um, from that. I uh, I took some screenshots of what this looks like. So maybe uh, later on in post, you can I'll, throw I'll them on there. Sure. So anyone watching yep. on YouTube, you'll be able to see the images of what this looks like. It's really slick. So you can just play them back, right back there in the car. You don't have to wait to get home or bring your laptop with you or anything. So far, I'm really happy with it. It works great. One thing I should mention is... Um, I was, I, we had a good discussion on Twitter on this today, and um, a couple of guys were saying, you know, be careful. Some of these uh, very active USB drives, like particularly the SanDisk Connect thing, right in the, uh, in the warranty, it says they're not designed for transmitting video surveillance stuff. They're not warranted for that. And they said mm -hmm. there's a higher incidence of file corruption. Yes, uh, I've seen a lot of that. Day. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll I'll be keeping an eye on it. I'll I'll let you guys know if it turns out that there's a big issue with it. But um, for the amount of time that I actually need the thing, you know, my car usually stays at home or at the office. It's not a huge thing, but I, I figure it's worth a shot. You know, for fifty bucks Canadian to mm -hmm. get one of these things and then the app. Well, that's um, pretty cheap. It is. Yeah. No, the pricing was good. I got that off Amazon.ca. So. Well, I know there's been talk, of course, because uh, between us moderators on the forum, um, you know, some of them are, are going with uh, solid state drives now. They make these really tiny solid state drives, now, a Samsung T5, um, which is really small. I've ordered one personally for some testing. Um, I recommend if anybody's looking for something like a solid state drive uh, to be able to store more of this stuff, I highly recommend you look at the Samsung T5. I'll have more to say about that, and there's a reason I say that, but I can't talk about that yet. Um, in due time, it'll make more sense. So, by the way, can I, I just a say teaser how, for later? <laughs> can I just say Go how ahead, impressive Eric. it is that we had? I mean, how long ago would you say you last used a 1.44 megabyte? Five. Megabyte. <laughs> <laughs> You know I mean? um, we're, we're, 1998 we're, right so it's it's been you know 20 some odd years but look how look how far we've come in terms of technology that what he was just holding in his hand is essentially this what would you say it's even smaller than like a lipstick ian oh yeah yeah uh about like the same like, length like, and maybe half the width sure right so think of it like a small tube of lip balm and that's yeah. 64 gigabytes yeah, and then that's the that's the baby one. You can get a two fifty six, no problem. Yeah, micro SD card these days, you can get them in terabyte. I know, isn't that crazy? That, isn't that's that the most mental thing imaginable. That's like so <laughs> sci fi to me. <laughs> I watch like I watch classic films like War Games when they had the you know the all whopper. the large right with the yeah. whopper and the computer boxes. I'm like that, and those things were impressive. I mean, we're now celebrating this year Apollo fifty uh, with the race to the moon and the computers that they had on the Apollo program on the various um, spacecraft that land on the moon, those computers are no more powerful than what's in our cell phones today. It's just oh, crazy. Your, your cell phone Spe would be dead. Oh, yeah. Speaking of which, I, I got my LEM kit. My oh, the, did you? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I bought it, yeah. Nice. Yeah. As soon as it became available, I ordered it. So Ching. sitting upstairs, I haven't put it together yet, but... <laughs> I'll put it behind me on my shelf eventually. So. Just eat, eat the lemon meringue first. I keep staring at the damn thing. <laughs> yeah, I had it's to say like that. It's, yeah, beckoning, it's, me. it's beckoning me. It's so beckoning well. me. <laughs> Hello, All right, let's Trevor. finish the podcast so I can stuff my face. <laughs> eat me, Trevor. Uh, eat me. Yes, yes, yes. Well, moving along, I want to mention uh, one more thing here. Of course, Tesla finally listened to us and has updated their website now. So if you go and look at their cars, they now have a toggle at the top where you can flip between purchase price and include potential savings. Now, it defaults to include potential savings. So, you know, they're about uh, two steps forward and one step back, but at least it's a little bit more obvious rather than always looking down at the bottom. So if you switch it over to purchase price, it shows you the real purchase price of the car and not the uh, included potential savings, which I think is a little misleading, but it's a step in the right direction. So if you're on there, um, do that toggle. Unfortunately, if you refresh the page, it always goes back to potential savings. Tesla, please eliminate that function as far as I'm concerned. But there you go. Change is always good. Um, I want to talk about one more thing before we get on to viewer and listener questions. I was at a Tesla owners club, a official Tesla owners club, the Ontario one here. And they did something really cool. Um, it's been in the works for some time. Uh, but at the meeting on the stage, uh, John Dixon had a white sheet over top of something. And we were all scratching our heads like, what the heck is that? 
thing that he did. Well, at the end of the meeting, to make a long story short, he pulled the cover off and revealed this. It is a trash can. Now, what's the big deal about trash cans? Well, we all know superchargers, you know, people throwing diapers on the ground and garbage and all the other stuff. It's always a problem. So they've taken it upon themselves with Tesla's permission and the property owners uh, to start deploying some of these uh, branded trash cans. So you'll see here, uh, of course, you guys probably can't see it here, but if on the YouTube channel, you can certainly see it. So they've got these red trash cans. Uh, they're the old mesh type, so they'll have a garbage bag inside. It says, join our club at teslaownersclub.ca. And I have a feeling that this thing is going to do really well in the rest of the clubs. Uh, it's painted in Tesla red and stuff. It's donated by so-and-so. And they are going to start deploying these. The first three locations, or four locations here in Ontario, will be Sherway Gardens, Lime Ridge Mall, Markville Shopping Center, and Fairview Mall. So... Uh, Good on that. I mean, everybody was very happy about that. So I think when they do this, um, of course, there'll, there'll be some news being spread around and stuff that I think this is going to do really well. And I hope the other clubs uh, take up on this. Again, it's a pilot program. This is not uh, forever. We'll see how things go. But I think it's uh, it's good that uh, the clubs are taking the onus upon themselves to actually fix this, 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 um, this problem of the trash problem. Because I've been to many different superchargers, of course, and uh, yeah, more than enough, they don't, they don't generally have any trash. And of course, if you have something, you don't know where to put it. So uh, yeah, kudos to the Ontario Club for doing that. It was, uh, it was very well received. So, mm -hmm. Trevor, if I can just ask a question, was there any discussion about just because of the nature of the cars and the fact that a lot of the owners, I think all of us included, are fairly environmentally uh, uh, conscious, is there any um, talk about maybe doing recycling bins as well? That was discussed. Um, the thing is, is that they only had limited funds. These garbage cans were $500 each, so Ooh. they're not cheap. Whoa. Um, they said that garbage cans that have the multiples go into several thousands of dollars. So, oh my God. you know, I'm in the wrong business. But yeah. Anyways, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, yes, it was discussed. Um, they don't know how they're going to address it. Like I said, it's a pilot program. We'll see how it goes. Um, they're going to designate, I guess, some people to go around and, and sort of tidy these up, uh, unless the property managers, that's part of the agreement they're going to do. Uh, we don't know all the details yet, but, uh, yes, I understand where you're coming from. It is, um, something that was discussed, but right at this point, they're just going to do this for now and just see where it goes. But, uh, I think it's, like I said, it's still, still a, a good step in the right direction. Well, yeah, at least it keeps the concerned. property clean. That's already a, definitely a, a good move forward. Yeah, exactly. All right. Any, uh, closing things before we get on to viewer and listener questions, guys? Hmm. Eric, no, anything going on with you this week? <laughs> there, there may be some news. We'll uh, we'll talk about that okay. next week. Okay, sure, fair enough. Uh -huh. All right, well, let's uh, do some viewer questions right after we hear from one of our sponsors. Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. Oh, pie. <laughs> he caved. You're gonna you're gonna have a hard time editing. Oh, god, that's sour. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that should go on the show. That's too good. Oh, that pie is sour. Mm. Oh my god, delicious. that's sour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We're we're gonna answer questions now. Sorry, mm, I just I had to lick the pie because mm, it was just beckoning me. <laughs> Uh, first, I want to say thank you for everybody for chiming in with your questions. As usual, we ask the questions on the day of the podcast on Twitter. It's a Google form you fill in, so if you've got questions about Tesla or your car or whatever the case may be, uh, you can submit it for us to um, talk about on the podcast. And we try our best to answer the questions. If we don't have it, we'll if we don't have the answers, we'll let you know. Uh, sometimes it's speculation, but we try to answer them as accurately as we can. All right, first question comes from uh, Kieran. Uh, he says, given that not all features currently or shortly to be available for FSD in the U.S. are not available globally, as in in Australia, where the Model 3 has just opened, uh, do you think the website for each country should be more clear as to the features currently available so buyers can be better informed? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, my personal opinion, 
Well, first of all, I don't think they have the resources to do that all the time because it's constantly changing. But I do think it's probably a good idea. Um, I don't know uh, what's really... I don't know what the true anth- what the true solution for this to be. I do know that right now Tesla's in the middle of a, an end of quarter push, as they always are. Uh, they still haven't figured out how to smooth that stuff out yet. And I do know that the employees are are worked quite hard in order to deliver the cars. People don't get enough training or orientation on the cars, which is something that I'm hoping to talk about a little bit uh, in the near future. Um, so the onus is really on the owner to spend some more time. But, you know, let's face it, most people don't have enough time to watch every YouTube video on how autopilot works and stuff. So I think there's some merit to this. Um, what do you guys think? Do you think that they should do something like this or just kind of leave it because it's in constant state of flux and regulatory approval has to be obtained? Um, do you think that would be maybe wasted? I don't know. That's I a mean, tough call. Go ahead. Uh, here, here's my here's my overall thought. So it's it's a good question on on a, on the surface because we've had a lot of dialogue in the forums on this show uh, and many other mediums about what people can and can't get. We just talked about earlier in this show uh, the availability of even certain color seats for the interior in some countries. So I think overall it's good to list what full self-driving will eventually do. We know right now there's been some reports coming out uh, in the last day or so where maybe, possibly, some people are getting a certain update uh, on their vehicles that might, in a way, include <laughs> some components of full self-driving. Um, first I am first not, rule of Fight Club. You don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not one of those. Um, but I, I, think it's, it's, I think it's good to sort of keep it consistent and just leave it the way that it is for right now, um, unless it's very definitive here's exactly what the cars are going to be configured with based on your location. Um, especially as the markets expand, what cars are available in certain places. Uh, so I think, I think it makes sense to leave it as it is for now. Uh, but it is, I think it's a good thought experiment down the road. Um, as more vehicles come online, as more options might become available, uh, certain production uh, ramp-ups may happen that they sort of uh, clear the air a bit on that one. But I would say leave it as it is for now. Okay. Next question comes from Ken. He says, what does the Q mean in Tesla Q? T-S-L-A-Q. Now, I've this is it, all... Trevor. Yes, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> this is on Twitter. Um, uh, T-S-L-A-Q, of course, the Tesla stock um, ticker is T-S-L-A. Um, the Q is when a company goes bankrupt, they add the Q to the end. That indicates the company is bankrupt. So when you see Tesla Q, the people are that are using that are trying to tag the people that are the shorters, the really nasty, noisy negativists. They call themselves Tesla Q. Uh, these are the people that want Tesla to go bankrupt for whatever reason. They hate Elon, hate the cars, whatever the case may be. So when you see Tesla Q, that is the group of people on Twitter that are trying to do stock market manipulation and they're hating on Tesla. That's what the Q means. And that's all I'll say about that. Just block them. They're fun. (laughs) You will not find a more villainous hive of, uh, yeah, well, you know how the Star Wars quote goes. All right. Next next question comes from Kevin. He says, I took delivery of my Model 3 with FSD on April 17. I love it. Congratulations. Uh, This might be a dumb question, but uh, how do I know if I have the new FSD board? Everybody wants to know this. Yes. Well, Kevin, unfortunately, in a Model 3, there's no way to know. Um, now, Elon did say that uh, a certain uh, percentage of the cars uh, had started getting F- uh, the FSD computer, new hardware three, as we call it. <clears throat> um, uh, I think it was March. In an S or an X, it's actually easier because of the position of the computer. The, the computer is actually this little shoebox thing, and it sits in the dash on the right-hand side. So if you take the side panel off, you take the trim out, you're going to see a... a, a uh, an aluminum colored box. That's the um, FSD computer. If you look on the on the right hand side, if you see an HDMI port, that is the new FSD computer. If you don't see an HDMI port, it's not the FSD computer. You have 2.5. Now on the Model 3, the actual MCU, which is the computer that runs the screen and the autopilot computer, they're two boards. They're actually sandwiched together and they're in the same enclosure and it's on the firewall deep inside the car. It's actually behind the glove box, so it's not easy to pull out and take a look at. You'd actually have to pull it apart. And um, so that's the only way to determine. There's no way to pull it up on the computer screen to find out what it is. So I hope that answers your question, Kevin. It's the best Just, we can do right now. 
I can elaborate on that. Uh, there's been some discussion back and forth in the forum. I think the general consensus is is pretty much all Model 3s as of April production. So if it's an April build, if you open your door jam and it shows that's there's true. an April build to date uh, on the car, there's a very high likelihood that you have it. Um, okay. there, Good point. Yeah. Okay, good point. All right, next question comes from Jared. He says, do the graphics and car lights on the new display for 2019 16.2 indicate that your actual lights are working or if you had a tail light out or would someone have to tell you? Oh, well, I do know that on at least on the SNX, if you have a burnt out light, um, the lights on the car, on the display, when you look at it sideways, whatever, uh, they're burnt out. They don't flash either. So might be the same in a Model 3. Uh, hard to say because, you know, with LED lights, it's like they last pretty much forever. Mm-hmm. I'm going to run uh, the experiment. I'll, I'll just disconnect one and see what happens. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a good idea. It's easy enough to do. All right. Next question comes from uh, Prasanna. It says, uh, Model S and X refresh with the upgraded battery. Probably Maxwell. Well, we don't know. And a 400-mile range is game-changing. Question. Any plans of Tesla converting to CCS and opening Tesla uh, superchargers to others? One account charge anywhere. Uh, with these changes, it shuts down the debate as to whether to charge uh, and range anxiety. Well, okay, first of all, we know where this is coming from. Our good friends, uh, Kim, on the Light Tesla channel, put out a video uh, just a couple of days ago and said that they had inside information um, where Tesla was going to do a major refresh on the S and the X, and it's more than just the interior. Now, I'll be honest. I mean, I've been on the receiving end of tips uh, from insiders at Tesla. And, you know, the first thing you have to remember is that there's no way to really verify this stuff because sometimes you get information and, you know, half the time it's real. Other times it's not 100% accurate. I mean, I've, I've had it both ways. Um, all you can do is just kind of report what you hear. And if that sounds credible, you just kind of go with it. But by, by, by no means is that actually verified. Now, one of the things that she said in the video, of course, let's talk about this. Let's why, yeah, since we're here, we'll talk about it. Um, that the S was going to get a single motor in the front, of course, largely the Raven motor, which is pulled from the Model 3, and they were going to convert the rear of the car to two motors. Now, on the surface, you think, oh, well, that sounds a little bit crazy, but it's not the first time they've done it. Uh, they did it on the Roadster. So I think some of that technology is actually plausible if they want. Look, let's face it, the Model S in some ways is lacking in certain in certain ways uh, with the technology. So it really needs to be brought up. Um, it's a matter of time as to when they do the refresh. The interior refresh of the car is another matter altogether. That's been rumored for over a year. So it's just a matter of time before they do that. Given, however, the fact that they just did a refresh on the Model S, they just did the Raven motors, which upgraded the um, the power electronics, the, um, uh, the suspension on the car, and uh, you know, put the new PMAG motor in the front, I think that on the surface, it would be like, well, it's awfully soon to be updating the car yet again. If they do this in Q3, um, you risk upsetting a lot of people, of course, uh, that paid all this money to, uh, to upgrade their cars. So um, it's not out of the realm of possibility because, you know, Tesla being Tesla, they can certainly do something like that if they so choose to. But, uh, you know, what's the risk of doing that? So who knows? Um, I, th I think on the surface, I think it sounds plausible. It's just the timing, I don't think. Uh, would jive to do everything all at once. Maybe they're going to do a staggered thing. Um, I still, in my mind, I don't think it's really rocking the boat too much if they were to do an interior refresh in the third quarter and leave the other stuff for later. I don't know. Any thoughts on your end? The um, the only thing that stood out to me was the um, any plans for them to open up superchargers to others. That was covered in um, Ryan's That's right. interview. Uh, mm -hmm. Elon said, he asked them that question. He said, you know, have other OEMs approached you about using the network? And he says, nope, my, my phone has not rung. Now he says, maybe somebody within the organization has been contacted and it just didn't make it to me, but there's been no serious interest. That blows my mind. I mean, it just goes to, to show to what point, you know, there's this not invented here syndrome or this, you know, like, oh, we're not going to partner with this little this little company out of California. Who the hell are they to, to, to pioneer well, that? Well, it's funny you say that because, you know, that's something that I've observed in the car industry. The not invented here syndrome is very yeah. real. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, and using the Tesla superchargers is an admission of, you know, they're superior. So I, I think a lot of companies, of course, um, are not wanting to do that they want to do their own thing or they just basically say well, it's not our problem right we'll wash our hands of it right we're going to make compliance cars and it's not our problem anymore um i don't know 
Um, as far as the other thing too that was discussed in this, of course, you know, uh, Prasanna asked about the battery situation. I, and I've said this many times before, we've talked about it on the show. I think it's a matter of time, not if, when Tesla moves to a 2170 cell. I don't think it makes sense for them to keep sticking to 18650s given, you know, potential cost savings where they can put the uh, profits of the car maybe somewhere else in order to, you know, to, to improve certain aspects of the car. I think it's just a matter of time. They're all in on this new format cell. Um, having said that, if you're going to move to a 2170 cell, um, you have to re-engineer a lot of that battery pack. Now, whether Tesla changes the battery pack or not, if they do change the battery pack, let's say they have to change the form factor in some shape, way, or form, you have to remember the S and X are largely built around that battery pack. So how much more of the vehicle is going to change? So at that point, it's like a decision. Like, do you really revamp? Do you spend a lot of engineering effort to actually revamp the car because you changed the battery pack? Or do you try to shoehorn what you can into the battery to keep the body the way it is? And maybe you just do a, a couple updates like they did, a, you know, the, the nose cone refresh. Actually, the nose cone refresh, I, I have to be careful about that because the nose cone refresh that they did in April of 2016 on the Model S was more than just the nose cone. There's significant changes under the hood. They went from two heat exchangers to one. They moved it underneath. They put the HEPA filter. It, it was a large engineering project. So when you see a nose cone, it's not just plastics. It's more than there. So it's not the first time they've re-engineered re re a significant part of the Model S. So it's just a matter of do they have the resources? Have they been able to keep it secret? Yes, obviously. They talked about the Roadster. They developed that in their own little skunk work. So who knows uh, what's going to be happening? I mean, they did say that, um, you know, they claimed that they were testing this in, in the Mojave Desert, which is, of course, where you want to test for hot, you know, for hot temperatures and the cooling of the battery, which is, you know, one of the most important things about the car. So who knows what's going to happen? Um, the one thing, and I'll reiterate this because I have said it on the podcast before, one of the tidbits of information that I did get some time ago that any refresh of the Model S was likely going to come with a taillight update. Now, I read that one of two ways. Yes, a new design. But secondly, if you look at a Model 3, of course, it has a larger housing on the side for the charge port. So if they're going to update the taillight on the Model S or S or X, I should say, what better time to make it a little bigger to hide a CCS port in there? Um, I was at a car show this past weekend, and, and people were like, where's the charge port on the car? And I was like, figure it out. Mm -hmm. And they were like looking around for like two two, <laughs> like two minutes going around the car. Where's the charge port? And I had to show them. They were like, oh, that's really clever. It's hidden. Uh, you know, so if they're going to do something like that, it makes sense that they would switch to CCS. I mean, obviously, they did it for Europe, and they've been going around retrofitting all the superchargers with, uh, with the secondary cable. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities they would do that for North America. But... It's Tesla. It's like when they get around to doing it is when they'll get around to doing it. All right. I think we've talked about that enough. Uh, next question comes from Mark. He says, I watched a review on the Mercedes EQC. The reviewer, Carwow, uh, stated that the cruise control had a significant impact on batteries. Is this the same or worse for Tesla? I'd be interested to know the answer, Tesla fan in Ireland. Well, thank you for chiming in, Mark, from Ireland. Um, huh. Well, cruise control is basically mimicking a person driving with the pedal. Um, I would suggest, well, we all know that both the Mercedes and the EQC are not as efficient as Tesla's. That's been proven many, many times before by different reviewers. So if that's affecting their system, I don't think it's necessarily cruise control. It could just be the inefficiencies of the car. Um, it's one of those things where the, the person, and I watch CarWow, he's, he's a pretty neat guy. Um, I think it's one of those things that we'd have to, take one of those cars and pit it up against a Model S and, and do some di di uh, some testing on those cars. I think, uh, matter of fact, I, th I don't think, uh, what's his name? Bjorn. Oh, I can't believe Bjorn I forgot Nyland. his name. Yeah, Bjorn Nyland. Um, he did it with a Model I-Pace, a Model X, and what's the other one? The e-tron. Uh, EQC hasn't got his hands on yet. Um, and both of those cars, uh, non-Teslas, are not as efficient as, as the Tesla cars. So it's more than just cruise control. That's my personal opinion. I think, yeah, I, if I read the question directly, they're, they're saying like the EQC driven by human and the EQC driven by cruise control, there's, there's a significant difference. So taking out the fact that the EQC doesn't have the same efficiency, it gets worse by using the cruise. Now, Eric, I think you went ahead and answered even online today on, on Twitter. Uh, I did. We're seeing that. And uh, I, I agree exactly with what you wrote. In the Teslas, it doesn't seem to have a dramatic effect, although it is noticeable. I've noticed a few people over the years on forums have commented, you don't get quite the same efficiency. And I think it has to do with the fact that the, car, the way the car modulates speed, it's not quite as smooth as a human. Like right. we, we do a better job 
right now anyway, once hardware three and FSD comes in, who knows how amazing it's going to get. But I think right now, humans, we can sort of better judge people's intent and traffic. And we sort of roll off the accelerate a little more gently and roll on to it. Mm -hmm. So you're not wasting as much energy. The um, the adaptive cruise tends to be a little bit more digital. It's kind of like I'm going right up to the end of the car and then whoop, now I'm slowing down. Mm, now I'm speeding up again. Mm. So it's a little bit. You know, more. I've noticed on NOA lately on the highways and stuff, it seems to be jerky. It's like it's always adjusting quite a bit. I I found. uh, I mean, go ahead, go ahead, Eric. No, I was gonna say because my experience with it too is, um, to your point, Ian, my reaction time is such that I predict it more, uh, uh, a lot easier because I'm aware of what the traffic's like here in South Florida. So for the most part, the drivers I'm I'm driving behind. I'm always cautious anyway. So I will ease off the accelerator much sooner than the car does. And the, and the car tries to, you know, unless it really sees based on, on whatever the camera sees and what the computer is calculating, it'll sort of push the boundaries of how it can maintain that speed before it's like, okay, I have to ease up now. And when it does that, instead of actually you, the human driver, which if you've driven EVs enough, you eventually become what's called a one pedal driver for the most part. Um, the car still acts like a two pedal driver mm-hmm. because it will, it will. And, and we've had this discussion before about, you know, whether the brake is pushed in by the computer and it does. There are times where you, it is pretty sub- substantial amount where it's pushed down almost as if your foot's on it versus just kind of like a light tapping. Um, I do notice that if I just have the traffic or cruise control, if, if let's say I have to drive 20 miles from door to door, from home to work, if I have tack on, maybe I'm using 22, 23 miles worth of energy on my car. Uh, if I have autopilot on, that may increase to 25, 26, because it just all depends on the um, the regenerative braking and the, just the, the driving conditions and so forth. So the overall question really comes down to compared to the Mercedes and to Tesla, you know, does Tesla seem to have, seem to have the same problem? It's not a substantial amount of energy loss it's noticeable if you're sort of paying attention every day. Um, but I, I try as much as I can, especially when it's like rush hour traffic to not use uh, NOA or use autopilot just because I know if I'm going to be slowing down all the time, I'm smoother at doing it than the car's computer is. But I think Ian's right. I think once we get more, uh, more improved versions of the hardware and as the software just gets better over time, uh, that there might be even like a setting option to, almost like a Mad Max mode in a way where you can, where you can sort of be uh, a little bit more cautious on that. So it's not so, uh, not so abrupt. Call it nervous Nelly. Nervous yeah. Right. Nelly. It just backs yeah. off. <laughs> well, there you go. I hope that answers your question, Mark. Um, thanks for sending that in. Next question comes from Anthony he says, how long after you take delivery of a model three, can you still use a referral code? <sighs> That's a good Ooh. question. Okay, well, listen, um, Tesla has been fairly strict about the usage of referral codes. I'm assuming at this point you want to add a referral code. You took your Model 3, maybe you didn't order with one. Um, Listen, since the um, last referral program ended, Tesla has been quite strict about the use of referral codes. If you're going to use a referral code um, to get the free supercharging, uh, you have to order the car with a referral code. Using that link, you cannot add it afterwards. Now, there have been some reports lately of Tesla or some employees, whatever, not following that rule, and it's still being a little bit wishy-washy. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you haven't used a referral code, fat chance of you being able to use one after the fact. Now, you know, in the last referral program that ran for basically a year and a half, they were pretty loosey-goosey about the whole thing. You know, if you took delivery of a car, they would still add it, whatever the case may be. But they largely shut that down because it got out of control. So I'm hoping that that's what you're asking for. If you're asking for someone else, well, that's a different matter altogether. But um, anyways, that's the situation as far as I'm aware of with that. Yeah, I've had it happen to a few people where they started the order and it was like, nope, the second the order goes through the system, if you haven't added the code, you're done. They're not. The other thing too is I've noticed is that I've had quite a few reports of people that tried to use the referral code, including mine or someone else's. And they, when they finally got their car, their and it never showed up, like it was never applied. So there seems to be some kind of, I don't know, glitch in the matrix or something like that. I don't know what's going on. Um, but if you want to use a referral code, you know, you got to make sure you order the car with it. Otherwise, you're just not going to get that perk. Okay, moving along. Next question comes from Dan. He says, regarding Model Y, what is the length and or cubic foot cargo with the second row up minus third row seats possible? 
Is it possible there would be more options for wheels? Well, that's two questions. Well, first of all, we don't have any specs from Tesla as far as actual cargo space. We know with the Model 3, the cargo space is 15 cubic feet. Um, earlier, before I began with the show, I went and looked at um, what I think is the competitor to the Model Y, essentially a uh, X3, BMW X3, because that's in the same category. Um, they're showing, I think it's about 56 cubic feet, 1,600 liters. Um, it would not surprise me that Model Y comes in with at least 25 to 30. Um, maybe it has to be compatible with that. So until we see the specs, we can't answer that definitively. But to all I'm going to say is what a Tesla engineer told me when I asked him specifically as to whether the Model 3 seats were going to be 60-40 folding. He said, uh, we will be competitive. Uh, I remember from the reveal event, wasn't there a 66 cubic feet number floating around? I can't remember. Uh, if, if it did, I don't remember. Yeah, that's the number that sticks out in my mind. The problem is I can't remember if that's with the second row folded or not. Um, mm, good question. I'll have to go well, back. Well, and... uh, you know what? I'm, go I'm going to watch it, and I'll find that spot. And if I see it, I'll put it in post right like right here so yeah, you guys can see whether that's confirmed or not. You have a better memory than I do, and I was like two feet away from you. So, <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, something sticks. That was that moment that night. Well, the thing that we did our – our uh, our double take on was when he mentioned you know remember the supercharger v3 he said all yes. they will all be converted i mean the whole room just kind of went huh oh what yeah was that? that was a big jaw drop man yeah so anyways all right next question comes from michael he says uh, will the nema 1450 version of the hpwc also known as the wall connector ever be available again um you know remember a few months ago the um well not well could it be as little as two months ago uh, the wall connector was available in a plug-in version. You just plug it in NEMA 1450, and uh, they sold a few of them, and then poop, magically just disappeared off the Tesla website. It's still not there yet. I don't know what the answer to this is. Maybe it was a fluke. Maybe they had problems. Who knows? Um, you know, what is our old saying, boys? What, what Tesla, Tesla giveth, Tesla taketh away. That's right, exactly. So, again, if you see something you like, buy it right away. Do not hesitate because you'll never see it away. It's kind of like going to Costco. If you see something you like, yeah. buy it because it won't be there next week. That's perfect. All right. I hope that answers uh, two, that, Michael. Two I, quick, I, I, I was going to say yes, two quick fun please. facts about Costco. If you go to every Costco and you see the, uh, the price placards and there's like an asterisk on it, yeah, uh, that indicates it's a seasonal or temporary item. So that is definitely one you want to get while Ooh. it's there. There you go. Also, okay. if you ever see one um, where the price ends in a seven, like 1997, that is the lowest price. So you will never go any lower than that, and you might want to get it before they run out. Pro tips from Eric. Yeah, that's on cool. the Costco it's, situation. I'm a man of the people. <laughs> we we appreciate your efforts for the populace, my friend, comrade, You're <laughs> comrade Eric. Speaking of which, have you guys watched the Chernobyl series? Oh. I haven't. I've heard nothing but amazing accolades. For oh, them. my God. Is it ever good? It's It'll so make you mad and depressed at the same time. Incredibly intense. Like, yeah. just mind-bogglingly good. I I tried to describe it to somebody at the office today, and I was really at a loss for words. I said, it's, it's sad. It's enraging. It's fascinating. It's engaging. Like I can't find all the words, but it's like anybody out there watching or listening, if you have not seen the show, do what you need to do to get it. It's five episodes. It tells the story in such astonishing detail. And it's, it's a cautionary tale for all time of, of what happens, you know, in, in, a, in a state, you know, where basically the government controls everything and, you know, oh, highly wow. recommend it. Five stars. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on. Next question comes from Vlad. He says, related to AP1, Autopilot 1, um, will there be any retrofit for older models with the newer processor? The answer, Vlad, is no. Uh, there are no upgrades for the computers or the cars uh, with the cameras and the sensors and all this stuff. You really have to buy a new car. If you really want FSD, meaning the new hardware car, you really need a car that came originally with uh, Autopilot version 2. So those are easy to detect. Uh, just go look at a car. If it has the uh, cameras in the repeaters, which are the blinkers on the side, that's an AP2 2.5 car. So that's what you're going to need if you want to upgrade. Or oh, give right. Jason a call. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think he do it. Yeah, well, he did do it on, on his wife's car, but that's a different matter altogether. I think he said it cost him $9,000 worth of parts to do that. Wow. Yeah, I don't know what he would charge you to actually do it. But... Uh... Okay, well, the last question comes from Max, and he's in Japan. He says, first, thank you for your help, passion, dedication for all these years. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. We appreciate all the feedback. 
He says, uh, second question. He says, after valuing a long wait for the after valuating a long wait for the Model Y, I decided not uh, to order a Model Three. Uh, waiting for the white seats in Japan, not available yet. Yesterday, he said, I saw a red P3D with white seats, and I'm in love. Gorgeous car, and the quality is visibly improved compared to the lower VINs exposed in stores till last month. There's just one defect, water and snow falling in the trunk during bad weather. How is it possible that neither Tesla nor fans have come up with a working solution like they did with the rear folding seat slash? 3D printed gum, a sliding piece, uh, fantasy ideas. Uh, it would be a good business opportunity. Okay, um, well, our good friend Michael Bodner uh, had done a video where he showed that uh, that very same problem. So if you have snow on the trunk on the back or some unmelted snow on the rear glass window and it starts melting, and if you open it up, there's a good chance it may slide in to the trunk. Um, Michael was uh, very early on. Um, actually, he did with rain because he didn't have snow in Florida. But anyways, the, the point is um, that... Uh, I think he reached out to Tesla and they said at the time that they were working on a new trunk seal, which is the rubber piece that goes around the opening. Um, they were going to have a higher lip at the back to potentially act as a dam to keep that window. Um, so they have done that retrofit. I've seen more recent cars that have a little higher lip. I don't know what the situation is. Maybe the car that you saw was an early VIN. It didn't have that new rubber seal. I can't answer as to whether it's been 100% fixed. Ian, what has been your experience in the winter months uh, well, with the situation? I learned very early on that you clean the snow off the back of the car before you open the trunk, because otherwise you got a trunk full of snow, <laughs> and That's it's no true. joke. It will fill it up good. Yep. So the snow thing is is definitely an issue. But I mean, you look living in a snowy climate, we get used to it. You you have to brush the car off before you go anywhere with it anyway, right? So, um, it, I don't really consider it a major inconvenience. Um, the water thing, though, I don't think is a, is nearly as big a deal. Now, we do know there's two generations of the seal. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming my car, because it's a 107-something VIN, is is got the newer one. I've never really had a problem with the water. I mean, you know, we don't get quite the torrential rain, certainly not as frequency, uh, fre frequently as we do, you know, see in the southern states, like in the Florida and some places like that. Um, I've never been caught out when a really bad rainstorm trying to do it. But on normal rainy day, no, I, I haven't had a problem with it. I know someone asked me on the weekend when they saw the Model X, they asked me the same question. What, what do you do when you have snow on the roof? And I said, well, it's called having two snow brushes, one in the car and one in the house. Oh, yeah. Well, and I take go. the snow off before I open the doors. Or you could just have it in the trunk. You don't know. Oh, and I do, and I have I have it there too. But, uh, but then again, it's tough to get the snow off because it doesn't melt. There's no engine in there <laughs> yeah. to heat it up and melt it, right? But no, I'm just in the habit of of taking the snow off. A nice thing, a good good good, uh, good selling point for uh, ceramic coatings. It makes the snow in the water just not stick very well. So that's the last of our questions. Well, let's leave it at that. I want to say uh, thank you for everyone for sending in your questions. As always, we really appreciate them. We love answering the questions and. Uh, trying to help you out with any questions that you may have. Eric, since you're on the screen, this is your opportunity to plug whatever you'd like and tell people where they can find you and chit-chat with you, whatever you like. Well, oh my God, this is so exciting. All right, so you guys can follow me on uh, their social media platforms galore. Uh, you can easily find me on Twitter. Uh, the handle is ECFIX, that is E-C-F-I-X. Uh, my thanks to all the new followers. I've had some good exchanges on all kinds of issues. Uh, we, I do more things to talk about Tesla. So if you want to talk about politics, the environment, which... Thank goodness uh, we're getting a focus on the earth and all the stuff going on with um, uh, climate change in recent conversations. That's always good to have. But hey, yeah, find me on social media. You can ask me anything. It doesn't matter. I'm not on the forum as much. I do have a handle. I think I have like two <laughs> posts in the forum. Um, but yeah, you can find me easily on Twitter. Uh, if we're friends on Facebook, good luck if you, if you want to find me there. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's where you guys can find me on Twitter. Awesome. How about you, Ian? Where can people find you? What do you want to plug? Uh, most commonly on Twitter, at Ian Pavelko is the handle. Um, at Tesla Owners Online, you can follow me, uh, find me with the handle Mad Hungarian. Uh, I try to spend most of my time there that I, I have available answering technical questions on wheels and tires, but I like to participate in a lot of other things. So if there's anything you want to know, um, just tag me in your post, uh, Matt Hungarian, and I will try to appear and be of assistance if I can. And finally, if you are looking for some... Uh, some Tesla wear. We have the, um, well, I'm modeling today, the Evolve wear shirts. Eric the original. Too. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, no, um, oh. Eric's got the WMA. 
So well, yes, it's yeah. the WMP. The design, yeah. So the weapons of mass adoption is what Mr. Camacho is um, so finely modeling for us. And I've got the classic Evolve wear going on here. Those you can find at Teespring, T-E-E, spring.com. And just uh, look up Mad Hungarian Evolve wear. And you will find my store with all the various designs and the proceeds raised go to fund um, various EV organizations across um, North America. As always, there will be a link in the podcast, so if you want to check it out, it's maybe a little bit easier. You can, instead of searching and Googling, you can just click on that. Well, as always, uh, you can find me on Twitter. The handle's Model3Owners. Check out the forum at Model3OwnersClub.com. Hey, I uh, want to say thank you to our sponsors. That's Evan X, Dulaban Insurance, and the great guys at Fine Lab Ceramic Coatings. I uh, love the ceramic coating on my car. It's awesome. So thank you for our sponsors for uh, for participating there. And um, that'll be it for this week. I'm, I'm going to eat my, my pie now, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, watching, no matter where you happen to be, and we'll catch you on the next one. See you guys. Good night. Bonsoir tout le monde. Bye.